Amen, brothers and sisters. If y'all want to turn those Bibles, the first John chapter three, we've been going through the series in first John. We already made it to chapter three. So <clears throat> let me give you a little bit of background. What was happening in the church back in this time, and the reason why John wrote this letter is because Gnosticism had infiltrated the church, the church of God. And John wrote because they believed they were teaching a false gospel. They were teaching a fake Jesus. It wasn't the Jesus of the Bible. They were teaching that Jesus was only spirit. Like I went over this already a couple of times. Just so I want people to, so when I preach on this sermon, they'll, they'll get this going in their mind. Is uh, They preached that Jesus was only spirit and that he didn't have no body, that he was just spirit form. So it didn't matter what happened in the flesh. So that's how they were living is it don't matter what happens in the flesh since I'm only spirit. So I can do whatever I want to do as I, as I'm living for Jesus, I can live how I want to do. I can live in with the lust of the eyes, lust of the role, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. It doesn't matter because Jesus is only spirit and it don't matter what I do in the flesh then. That's a lie. That's a lie from the pits of hell. God is not. I mean, Jesus came in the, Jesus is God. Came to this world in flesh because we are flesh. How, how would Jesus be able to pay for our sins if he didn't become us? He didn't come, become who he created. Right? So that's what I'm saying. So it, they were teaching this. So John writes a letter letting them know. Look what he says here. I love this. Let's just jump back. Chapter 1, verse 1. Look, look what he says. This is how you know. So he, John's hitting against what they were teaching the people. He didn't want them to start believing this stuff. So he was teaching against it. Look at First uh, John 1, chapter 1. This was what was from the beginning. Excuse me. What was from the beginning. And what we have heard and what we have seen. Do you see this? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, and what we have observed, and what we have what? touched we have touched that's why john is saying no pretty much we were with jesus we spoke with him we walked with him we touched him we observed him we studied him he is not just spirit he is flesh too so john rebuked that mess he rebuked it saying no if you're a child of god you're not going to be able to live in darkness why do we know that look what john we're going to jump around now jump to verse five one verse five this is a message we have we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. I like how some of the other translations say, no darkness in him at all. Look at verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. Straight up, Jesus says, God is saying to the power of his Holy Spirit, to Apostle John, if we say that you have fellowship with God and you walk in darkness, so what does darkness mean then? People say, well, what do say? Well, Tutti, what do you, what do you, what would you categorize darkness? Okay. It says, if you claim to have fellowship with God and continue to walk in darkness, you fill in the blank. Are you able to be in sexual immorality? Are you able to watch porn? Are you able to do drugs? Are you able to get drunk regularly? Are you able to cuss at people regularly? Are you able to be mad? Are you able to do these things regularly that God hates? That's darkness. That's darkness. God is saying, if you're claiming to be my child and yet walk in this way, look what he says. Not me. Blaming it on God. Verse 6 again. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. You know what God calls them? God says, you're a liar. If you say you're a believer and you yet walk in darkness. I'm not saying that. God says that. God says, that person who claims to be a believer and yet walks in darkness, that person is a liar. How does it start off? Why? What he said, God is light. And there, there's absolutely no darkness in him. This is why I love how John writes. He writes simple. He writes clear. Just He uses light and darkness. He's saying, how pretty much how can darkness mix with light? It can't. It can't. It can't mix. So that's what he's saying. He's like, it's impossible. There is no darkness in God at all. So then, 
You know what's going to start happening in your life? Stuff is going to start falling off when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Things will fall off. You will be convicted of how you talk. You will be convicted on how on how you do things for the Lord, of how you treat people, or how you don't treat people, because you, you should treat them in this other manner. Right? You're going to be convicted in these areas. If you're in immorality, you're going to be convicted. All right? Because the spirit of truth lives within you. And the Bible says the, the Holy Spirit will lead you to all truth. One of the Holy Spirit's jobs is to lead you in righteousness. And the one of the, John 6, I mean John 16, it says the Holy Spirit will convict the road of its sin and of righteousness in the coming judgment. That's one of the Holy Spirit's jobs. So if anybody's able to walk in this manner continuously and live in sin, that's saying the Holy Spirit not doing his job, which the Holy Spirit does just perfectly. That's God in the spirit form. So check this out. So God is saying that person that claims to be a believer and yet walks in darkness is a liar. So as we keep going, look at this. Okay. And then you go into verse 2. I'm going to fast forward through this. I mean, verse 2, chapter 2. It says, this is the kind of love. So I want you to hear me clearly because this is going to sound confusing, but it's, I'm not trying to be confusing. Right? This is the kind of love that God hates. So hear me out. The kind of love that God hates. What is the kind of love that God hates? People are like, that sounds weird to you. You're being confusing. No, I'm not. The kind of love that God hates is this kind of love. Chapter 2, verse 15, as we skate through this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Clearly, that's the kind of love that God hates. If somebody loves the world and the things of the world, so what do we can so what does that say? So that right there, that's like this jaw dropper of like that may contradict other scriptures, people may say, because God has called us that that they'll know that we're Christians by the way that we love. But then God is saying, Don't love the world. So what is he meaning? He says, So they'll know that we're Christians by the way that we live. We're called to love our enemies. We're called to pray for them. We're called to love those who persecute us. Right? We're called to love. So what does he mean by that? By that text right there. You know what he means? He doesn't mean, look, in the Genesis account, he says, God created this, God created this, God created that, and saw that it was good. Right? So we know that he's not talking about that. God created and it was good. So God is saying, if you love the things that people have created and conform to what they have created and call love, Rather than me, I hate that type of love. That's the type of love that God is talking about. It's like, do you love earthly things and temporal things that are perishing more than you love God? That's what he's saying. He says, that's the type of love that I hate. That's the type of love that God hates. He's looked how clear he says this. Verse 15, 215. Do not love the world. Right? If you just stop there and just let it hang a little bit. Do not love the world. Right? I mean, everything like just finish the verse. Why are you let it a little bit? It makes it don't feel too good. Don't love the world, but why? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Clearly, he says that the love of the Father, the love of God, is not in that person. Because you know why? The love of the world is in that person. And who's the who is the leader of this world? The devil, 2 Corinthians 4 says this. Satan is the God of this world. You know what? And you notice how Satan will just offer, offer you temporal things. And when he offers you these temporal things, you know why he offers you temporal things? Because his time is temporary here. He will be tortured in hell for all eternity under the wrath of God for all eternity. That's why he'll just offer you these temporal things. You know why? Misery loves company. Misery loves company. Notice this. And again, I'm a little bit off track, but it's good. It check this out. Like I've said before. Notice this, that the people that are in their sin, I got a lot of friends out there in the streets that are in their sin, and, and, and they'll try to talk you into this, this, who they believe Jesus is, to get you to kind of conform that way, because they don't like feeling convicted in their mind and in their heart, right? So they try to get you to conform to the world, right? And not be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And notice this, that when they talk to you about this other Jesus that's not the Jesus of the Bible, they want you to conform because they don't like feeling that way, because you know why? They don't want to be left alone. It's easier to believe 
It's easier to live your life with somebody else that's doing the drugs with you, that's being the sexual immorality with you, that's getting drunk with you, that's talking the way you talk with you. It's easier to do it. It's easier to do life together with them if you're in that sin with them. Notice this. Even when you were lost in the road, getting all messed up, hammered, whatever, you put in the blank. We all came from a background. We all came from a background. You know what? I know, and I, this is one thing I, I, I go against because God goes against is when some I've, I've talked to people before in the past and they said, uh, I'll tell them, when have you came to the Lord? Like, I, I always believe in Jesus. Like, wow, that's amazing. My Bible says that no one is righteous. No, not one. No one is seeking God. Right? How could you have always believed in Jesus? You haven't always believed in Jesus. No, you haven't. Because it, for the simple fact is you were in this mess. And you, some of you are still in this mess. I'm not talking about it here. I'm talking about my friends in the road. Right? So look at this. And people are continuing in this mess. So check this out. This is what I want to hit on. It's easier for them to live this way. Notice this. I did this. I have a messed up background. But God forgave me. It's easier to throw myself under the bus. Then whenever somebody else throws me under the bus, it's cool. It's like I already did it. I was on the bus. I was the wickedest of the wicked. God changed my soul. So look at this. You know what I did? It was easier for me to live with myself in my conscience and in my heart whenever I had my friends doing the same thing that I was doing. Because I was able to say, oh, buddy was doing it too. He's still out there doing it. I really, hey, at least I came home. My wife, I came home. They're still out there. I ain't as bad as them. I was able to justify it because I was home and I, I did a little bit better than my buddy did. But my buddy's out there all jacked up because of something that I gave him. And I wanted to justify it in my head. The, what they didn't else, what, what my family didn't know, what I, why my buddy ain't home and why he's away from his family. Because you actually gave him something that kept him away from his family. You know why? Check this out. But it's not only in that way. Are you able to condone sin and have people live in their sin comfortably? And live comfortably because you know why? Nobody wants to go to hell alone. Nobody wants to go to hell alone. The devil don't even want to go to hell alone. His goal is to take as many people with him to hell as he can. Because he knows where he knows where he's going. So check this out. So his children do the same thing too. His children do the same thing. And we're going to get to that as we keep fast forwarding through here. Look at this. So that's the kind of love that God hates. The love of the world. So let's go. We're going to jump through this. Chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. If you want to stand for the reading of the word of God. I was already going to start preaching on chapter 2 again. <laughs> Amen. Chapter 3, verse 1 through 10, in the name of Jesus. I'll be reading out of CSB. See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children, and we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Verse 2, dear, dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know what we know. That when he appears, meaning Jesus, we will be like him. How beautiful is that? Because we will see him as he is. Verse 3. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. Verse 4. Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed. He, meaning Jesus. He was revealed so that he might take away sins. And there is no sin in him. God bless you. Verse 6. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sin has, has not seen him or known him. Verse 7. Children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed, was manifested of the Son of the State. For this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. Verse 9. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. Seed abides in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. Verse 10. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does, look at this. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. Man, let's pray. Let's read the word of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, for your truth, for your love, for your promises, Father God. Your word that cuts like a knife. Father God, there's no other thing powerful in this world except your mighty word, Lord God. 
Father God, that you have your way with us today. Have your way with our hearts, Father God. If there's things that we're struggling with in our life, Father, that they break free today. The chains will be broken free today. They'll be left here today and that people walk free out in bondage. You said in your word, whoever the sun sets free is free indeed. Your gospel was so powerful that it will change lives today. Father God, thank you. Open up their hearts. If, somebody is, if somebody's not right with you in here today, if somebody that's hearing on Zoom or YouTube, open up their hearts and give them ears to hear and eyes to see the glorious light of your gospel and what Jesus has done for us, that he died for our sins and rose from the third day, freeing us from sin and death. The moment we put our faith and trust in him as our Lord and Savior and repent and believe your gospel and take you as our Lord and Savior, but that chains can be broken today. If you don't move, nothing will happen. We want a work of the Holy Spirit, not a work of the flesh. Human ever, human ever accomplishes nothing, but the Spirit alone gives life. We thank you and we love you, Lord Jesus. We ask all these things in your son's precious, holy, mighty, and powerful name, the Son of God. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to be seated, brothers and sisters. And I can feel the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. Verse 1. We're going to roll through this. And I love it. So this series, we're going through, this, we're going through a series of questions. I'm going to be asking us a series of questions. And I love it how John writes it so clearly is you're going to ask yourself these things and you're going to know clearly. You're going to know if I'm right with God or if I'm not right with God. But you know what it is? Some people may take it as like, I don't like feeling that way. Oh, that is loving that God is showing you that you're not right with him now instead of you dying and thinking that you're right with him and you get before the judgment seat of God and you hear these words. Depart from me, for I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Instead of hearing these words, enter into the kingdom. Well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. Don't, don't you want to hear that? I know I do. I know I do. I know what brothers and sisters do. So that's why I love how John writes here because it has you examine yourself. Are you really in the faith? Are you really in the faith? So as we go here, verse 1, 3, 1. See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Man, brothers and sisters, look at John's statement. On the last verse of chapter 2, verse 29. Look at John's statement in the last verse, chapter 2, 29. Before he goes into 3. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. That's what John ends before he goes into 3. Then John, John's saying that true believers have been born of God. That's what John is saying. True believers have been born of God. And knowing that, brothers and sisters, that should have us marvel, just as John marveled at the love that God had for him. Brothers and sisters, it's the same love that God has for you. For those that are in Christ Jesus. You know what John said? Look at others says, what great love that the Father has bestowed on us. John marveled, was just mesmerized by the love of God that he's he's like the love of God that God has for his children so look at this brothers and sisters believers hope is strengthened your hope is strengthened knowing this fact that God's love is what initiated his or her salvation let's look at Ephesians 1 Verse 3 through 7. We'll go through it together in here. Ephesians 1, verse 3 through 7. So our hope. It's beautiful whenever we know that God's the one that initiated it. God's the one that drew you to himself. The Bible says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. John 6 says that clearly. So look what it says. Ephesians 1, verse 3 through 7. Look at what he says here. Blessed is the God. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, in Christ. Verse 4, for he chose us in him before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless and love before him. Look how beautiful this is. Verse 5, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself. God did this for himself, not for you. According to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 6, 
to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Brothers and sisters, that's what John is writing about. That's what Paul's writing about, saying God did this. God's the one that called me to this. God's the one that's going to bring it out into completion. Paul goes on to write, Philippians, for God will finish the good work that he begun. If God started a good work in you, he will finish it. He will bring it to completion. But the thing you got to ask yourself, has a good work been started in your life? That's the question there. Has a good work been started? If a good work hasn't been started, there's nothing to bring to completion because it's never started it. If God started a good work in your life, he will bring it to completion. He will. He's a good God. You know why? Because he's doing it for him, for himself, because his name is on it. His name is on the line. That's why I'm saying God will carry it out. So this is what we're going to check our heart to. Let's go through this. So believers have this hope knowing that God's the one that initiated them and brought them to salvation. Believers should have this astonishment with the love that God has for them. Ask yourself, brothers and sisters, I know you go through trials and tribulations. We all do. A Christian will. But when you sit down and think about it, do you marvel? Do you just, are just floored with the love that God has for you? Knowing that when you fall and you slip, he loves you. Knowing that there's not these flaming hoops that you got to go through for him to love you more. That he loves you right where you're at. When you're really in Christ. So when you're really in Christ, if you're not in Christ, he don't love you where you're at. But when you're really in Christ, knowing that you don't have to go through these flaming hoops. That God doesn't love Apostle Paul more than he loves Brother Jesse, Brother Bob. God loves Brother Jesse, Sister Cat, Brother Bob, the same way he loves Apostle Paul. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? This is Apostle Paul. Paul didn't have to go through his flame to say, I beat you up, brothers. God loves us all, but he loves me just a little more. God's love is immeasurable to all his children. Different tools for different jobs, though. He just knew Paul was going to be able to carry out this different work. But it doesn't take away from the work that you're called to do for him. The work that you do for him, how much of it is really for God? Ask yourself here. The stuff that I do for God, how much is it really for God? Or is it really for me just in the name of God? I got to check my heart with that too. Do I do it for recognition? Check my heart too with that. Right? It's the things of the flesh that got to come off. Look at you see this. Brothers and sisters, the love that God has for us should surpass anything that this world can offer you. You know what? I'm not saying there's these things of the road, yes, we like, and we're gonna, it's going to be fun while we have them. I get it. But if you love those things more than you love God, something's wrong with your heart. What's wrong with your heart? You know what? Like I, I told my wife, I use this on myself. I love old trucks. I love them. And you know what I said, my wife? Praise God that I get to enjoy this thing until God burns it up. You know what? I'm not going to let it change my life. You know what? I'm not going to have it be an idol in my life. It's like, you know what? I can enjoy it until the Lord destroys this thing when he takes us home. Right? Until then, God, use this old truck to glorify your name if that's your will. But I don't want nothing in my life that's going to take me away from you and what you have for me so I can walk in the fullness of what you have given me. If there's things in your life that are holding you back from walking in the fullness of God and what God has given you and what God has called you to do for him, it's things we've got to check our hearts with. Check regularly. You know why? Because this world is just throwing them at you regularly. Work. You know what? Things on TV. Worldly things that will take you away from God. Things that you spend more time with other than God. Notice that. I have to do this at times. I've done this at times with my daughter. Nowadays, you know what? I'll use it on the enemy. The phone will tell you how long you've been on it. Right? I don't know how to work all these gadgets. My wife does. Melinda does, and I'll say, work that thing that let me know how many hours it's been on, right? Because I don't know how to do it, right? I've been on this long, I'm like, you've been on your phone that long. How much time have you spent in the Word of God today? If I looked up the things that you were looking up at, 
How many of them would be of, for God? It's right. It's how many of the things that you look up and really gaze upon daily, how much are they really for God? And so, check it out. This, the one that don't really use the phone, don't get away from this. Check this out. How many of the things that you do are you occupied with throughout your day? How many of it are you really doing it? God, use this for your glory. God, use this so that I can drop it with you. Use this. Is that you? Do you really have this concern of eternity? I have this fear. Because I know what the Bible, who, who God says he is in his, in his word. Even though I know I'm right with God, my life has been changed. I have this fear knowing that this is about to go down. That there's nothing that I can do to stop it. It has, but you know what it does? It has you live in this different manner. I don't want to do those things, Lord. I don't want him to catch you. I don't want you to catch me doing this stuff when you come back. I want you to catch me red-handed, being out in the field, trying to bring more people to you, Lord Jesus. So you see this, as you see this. Because the things in this world, because the things this world offers you are only temporary. And the love that God has for you is immeasurable, brothers and sisters and friends. Look at what Paul writes on cha Romans chapter 8, verse 12 through 17. We're going to zoom through this. Now hang with me. Romans 8, 12 to 17. Okay, as we go through this together. Look what Paul writes. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. 13. Because if you live according to the flesh, there it is again, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 14. For all those led by the Spirit are God's sons. For, well, look, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. 16. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Clear as day. Clear as day. Thank you, Jesus. Look at this. So you see here, brothers and sisters, this is this immeasurable love that John is talking about. This love that he bestowed on me. Check this out. The love that God bestowed on you, it should have you live a different life. Paul goes on to write in Corinthians that the love of God controls him. It compels him. So you know what it is? Somebody's going to say, well, we're under grace. God put me under, I'm under grace, so I, I can live this way. God showed me his grace. And check this out. If God showed you his grace, you won't want to do the things against God that he hates. You're going to check yourself in these areas. If God did this for me and drank my hell, what I deserve to pay for in hell for all eternity? Can you imagine this? I was just thinking about, let's just go here with this. Can you imagine a powerful being, an angel, a powerful being that can die. An angel can die. Can you imagine if God took the veils off your eyes and you saw two angels fighting each other? An angel of the devil, an angel of God, and they're just going at it, stabbing themselves with a sword. Check this out. And they're not dying. They're not dying because they can't die because they're spiritual beings. Can you imagine if God would let you see that? These angels just boom, going at it, boom. Feathers from wings flying everywhere, boom, just going at it at full force. Full force, and they're not dying because they can't die. And just constantly going at it, constantly battling, battling. Now check this out. Now imagine the angels of the devil going to hell, being tortured. Check it out. If God will let you face an angel alone, he'll devour you. There's no way you could stand against a, a powerful being like that without God on your side. There's no way. There's no way. Right? We see that through the Bible. Angels were taking out thousands and thousands of people. So check this out. Can you imagine that angel going to hell and being tortured for all eternity under the wrath of God because they rejected God, because they didn't listen to God and his commands? Now check this out. Now imagine a human being going there and never coming out of there under the wrath of God, rightfully so, because we've sinned against a holy God. And that person never accepted Jesus and wanted their sin more than they wanted Jesus. And no matter if somebody says, well, I really don't believe in hell, it don't matter what you believe. What's true? What's true? I don't believe in hell, so what? Right? 
I don't believe that I'm going to speak for another hour. Might be two. Right? This is what I'm saying. So this is what I'm saying. It don't matter what you believe. No, forgive me. I take that back. Rewind. It does matter what you believe. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> what you believe, is it fact? Is it true? Is it true? Some people say, I don't believe in hell. It don't matter. It, it, hell was there. Just you not believing it doesn't make it go away. So check this out. Imagine going there and never coming out of there. So check this out. Imagine a lot of our family members that are not right with God still. Imagine them going there. The Bible says, the many are caught for your children. The Bible says, Jesus said, so the gateway to hell was brought and, and, and many find it. And the gateway to life is narrow. And few find it. The words of Christ himself. So check this out. Can you imagine now, God, you were going into the pits of hell, plunging, and you were like, you couldn't get there fast enough. You wanted to get there even faster. Do you know whenever people skydive and then they put their arm, I've never skydived, but I've seen it, right? And it looks trippy, right? When you skydive out of the, the helicopter or the plane and you put your arms down, notice how they get some like top speed. Like they put their arm down, they're just like, they're zooming like a missile. But once they open up, it starts getting, they start floating, right? Check this out. This is how we were. We just put our arms down and zoom in to hell. We couldn't get there fast enough. We wanted it, not even knowing it, because we wanted our sins bad. And you know what God did? As you were going there, bah, he grabbed you and saved you from the pits of hell. So check this out. If God did that for you, which he did, if you're saved, how much more should you look at your sin like, I'm really struggling with this? My language can't change? The way I treat these people, I can't change it? And God did that for me? He died the death I should have died. He rose on the third day so that I can be set free from sin and death. Can you imagine that? And then we want to struggle with our stuff that we can't get rid of in our lives. So look at this, brothers and sisters. So when you look at it that way, it should make your sin look a lot punier. Right? As we keep trucking. <laughs> brothers and sisters. Look at what this pastor once said. This wise pastor. He said something like this. The real alien. So look at, when people look at us this way, they're going to look at us like, we're crazy. Like those people really believe that. Yes, I really believe the Bible. I really believe it. It's changed my life. Look at this. But says this pastor once said this. And went something like this. That the real aliens in this world are not extraterrestrials. And I'm not going to get into that. That's a sermon on its own. I'm not going to get into that stuff. Right? But the real aliens... In this life, are not extraterrestrials. The real aliens in this world are real Christians. And the reason is because we have been born again. We have been given a new nature, a heavenly origin. We've been given a life that's not from this earth. Jesus says, my kingdom is, Jesus says himself, my kingdom is not of this world. He says, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants will be fighting for me. Will be fighting. That pretty much the angels will be fighting to keep this. Like my kingdom is not of this world. Brothers and sisters, we're going to be in an earthly kingdom created by the hands of God. Not here. God's going to remake a new heaven and a new earth. So look at as we keep going through this. So that's why people look at you like you're weird. And true Christians, look at this, and true Christians will display a new nature. They will. If you're a believer, you will display a new nature. You will have a new nature. How are you going to be born again and have the same life? You will have a new nature. You will have a new nature. God says you will. You will have a new nature and you will have a new lifestyle. That is like our Savior and Heavenly Father. will walk in His likeness. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect like Him, but you're going to strive to be like Him. Little by little, as you grow years and years in the faith, notice how more mature you grow and know your Creator more and more. If you've been years in the faith and you're going more backwards and forwards, something's wrong. You've been self-deceived, I believe. Look at this. It is a nature that is totally foreign. It is going to seem, like I said, it's going to seem like you're out of this world. It's going to seem like you're out of your mind to the unsaved. They don't get it and they never will. So the question is, this is the question. The question is, do you really see that? Do you really see that you have been given a new nature. Do you see that in your life, brother and sister? Friends, people that will hear me on Zoom, YouTube later on. Do you really see in your life that you've been given a new nature? Do you really see where you're walking in that new nature? Do you really see that? 
If not, have you been self-deceived? John says, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't act like you're right with God if you're not. That's the most dangerous thing you can do. You can be really made right with God. Or you have to act like it. Just so somebody can believe that you might go to heaven? Why? Or would you want to trick somebody to think that you're going to heaven when you can really go? You can really get there. Or would you fake it? Just, you know why? But you know what happens? Sin has, sin has you fake it. I want to be right with God. And, my, and people think that in their head so they can keep going out and doing what they're doing. You want to be self-justified in their head. They don't work. Notice how their life ends up all jacked up. It's true. So you see here. Look at your life. Are you able to do the things? The, are you able to do the things of the road? Things the road loves. Are you able to condone hardcore sin regularly? Are you able to condone it? Are you able to be comfortable around it? Is the unbeliever able to be comfortable around you because you're condoning their sin? That's where you got to check your heart. Are you able to do that? You know what happened? When Jesus was around, people couldn't be comfortable in their sin. They had to get them, they had to get them away. Notice Stephen. When they stoned Stephen, what were they doing before they stoned him? They were covering their ears. They couldn't hear it. They couldn't hear it. They didn't want to hear the truth. Look at this. Can you really see that you have been born again? Can you really see that you are really saved, like I said, or have you been self-deceived? Look at what John says on First John chapter one, verse five through six. We're gonna jump around. First John chapter one, verse five through six. This is a message we have heard from Him and declare to you: God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in Him. Verse six: If we say we walk, uh, excuse me, if we say we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. John says we're lying and not practicing the truth. And you keep zooming, zooming through this, brothers and sisters. God's children will separate from the road automatically. Notice this. When you got saved, did automatically part of your life separate from what you used to do? Or are you able to do the same things that you used to do when you were unsaved? Are you able to tempt around with someone? Because this is where the devil will trick you too. Well, at least I wasn't as bad as I was then. They would want you to think that. You know why? He wants you just to tamp around just, just enough. Just enough to keep you in your sin. He knows he's not going to throw some full-blown drugs, full-blown alcohol, alcoholism in there, full-blown lust, full-blown adultery. He knows that. He's smart. He's good at what he does. He's not going to do that. He's going to do just enough to keep you in your sin. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. That's how it is. How can you imagine the devil's Telling his demons, leave that person alone. That person thinks that they're so good with God. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Because the more we mess with them, he's going to know something's up. Is that you? Are you able to condone this sin? Notice it. Notice even when you say sin, it sounds even weird, right? It's because our flesh don't like it. Look at this. I'm going to point out something to y'all. So are we able... Or did you see that in your life where you were separated automatically when you believed in Christ? Yes, we live in this world, but we're not of this world. We are the salt of the world. We are the light in darkness. We should be a beacon of hope to the lost, but we should never blend in with the world. Never blend in with the world. For God said, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. It's not going to start. Check this out, brothers and sisters. This is one thing. I preach to myself. It's not going to start when Jesus comes. Can you imagine how dumb that is? Like, Jesus, I'm going to start living for you when you come back. Can you imagine this? Oh, Jesus, I'm so glad you're here. I was just struggling with that stuff for a while. I knew that when you came, it was going to fall off of me. Now me and you can start a relationship now. Really? When you get saved by God, the living for God starts now. Living for heaven starts now. Stacking your riches in heaven starts here on earth. You stack them in heaven. That's why Jesus says, store your riches in heaven where moth and rust will destroy them, where thieves will break in and steal them. Because it starts here. Your relationship with Jesus starts here. It don't start whenever Jesus comes. Let me start now with you. I was just struggling with the sin. No, you weren't. You were just indulging it. Look at this. You know why this will not happen? Because 
Look what God says. Because everyone who has this hope in Jesus Christ will do this. People say, we'll do what, Tootie? We'll do what, Tootie? Okay, you know why this relationship is not going to start when just Jesus comes? Look at verse 3. 3-3. Three, three. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. God says that, not me. You're like, well, you're preaching hard, Tootie. What do you mean it's hard? It's talking about God here. I'm talking about God here. What I'm saying is like, it blows my mind at times when people say, I feel this way. I've had people out there tell me, it's like, when I talk with you, it feels like I'm going to hell. Because like, I read you some scripture. It's weird. I read you the Bible and you feel like you're going to hell. Maybe because you are on your way to hell. Maybe God just sent me just to let you know that you don't have to go there. Like, how is it my fault? Like, they're looking at me like it's my fault. When I talk to you, man, you make me feel like I'm going to hell. What do you make you feel that? I make you feel like you feel that way because of what I'm reading you and the way I'm living in front of you. You're not comfortable with your sin. And praise God, God just used your loss, your, you being lost in your sin to let me know that I'm on the right path. You need to repent and come to God. Right? This is what I'm saying. So people, people won't talk about this. You know why? Because they want people to be, no, you're going to push them away. Judy, you're going to push them away. What do you mean they're so far away? I'm trying to bring them back, man. We're trying to bring them back to Jesus. Look at this. As you see here, you saw this in verse 3. It says, you know why? The one who has this hope, what hope? That Jesus is going to come back and we're going to be like him just as he is holy. He says, be holy as I am holy. God says this. Okay, it says, those who have this hope, what hope? That God, I am saved by God. That God is, has saved me. That God has transformed my life. Okay, if you have this hope, you know what it's going to have you do? It's going to have you live in such a manner that you want to live right. So when Jesus gets here, you're not caught red-handed in your mess. You know what, Lord? I served you fully. You know what, Lord? Here it is. I don't even want to look at your glory. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine him saying, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of your master. Can you imagine that? Everything we've done to him. I didn't want to look at him. Man, I can just picture when it's going to happen. And for him to comfort you and say, get up. I paid for you. With my life. Can you imagine that? And then us want to live in some way that we want to live here. This is the love of God that John is talking about. That he bestowed on us. He's like, I had a marvel. Like, God loves me this much? You know what? Him letting me just go to heaven. Check this out. Not even that. If he would have just saved me from hell and left me in the woods in a cave, that would be enough. But he said, you know what? I sent my son to pay for your sins. So you can be with me where I am for all eternity. So you can sit around my table and I can serve you. I have a chair waiting for you. I have a mini mansions for you. When I'm done making them, I'm going to come and get you so you can be where I am. All that? God, you're doing all that for somebody like me? Yes, I am because my son paid for you. It's been paid in full. The wrath of God has been satisfied. There's no more wrath that you have to pay. No more. Gone forever. Sin and death. But for those who reject the Son of God, all there is is wrath. All there is is wrath. But you don't have to be. You don't have to be. As you go here. So it's going to have you live in this manner. Verse 3 again. Brothers and sisters, living in the reality of Jesus' return will make a difference in a real Christian's behavior. Knowing that someday... Real Christians will be like him. He will have you live in this manner. Knowing that someday that you're going to see him as he is. It will make you live a different life. You know why? Because the gospel is so powerful. What Jesus did for you on that cross is so powerful. And you know what? It's so powerful and it's so offensive. It's so offensive. That's why we killed Jesus. We didn't want to hear it. But when he was on that cross, he said, Lord, forgive him for the end. I know what they do. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he became us. He died alone. Separated from God the Father. Under the wrath of God the Father. 
for us not to want to let go of our sin, how we talk at times. Come on, man. This is God we're talking about. Brothers and sisters, there should be a desire in a real Christian's life to be more and more like Jesus. You know one thing? You will hear? Only Jesus was perfect, Tootie. Check this out. And they'll say, you know, only Jesus is perfect, Tootie. How do you want me to be like him? You know what I say to them? Because God wants me to be like him. Simple. And because I really believe the Bible. And look at what it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 6. 1 John 2, 3 through 6. This is how we know that we know him. Who's him? Jesus. God. This is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commands. The one who says, I have come to know him and yet does not keep his commandments. Commands, excuse me, is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly in him, the love of God is made complete. This is how we know that we know him. Verse 6. The one who says they remain in him should walk just as Jesus walked. How do you get around that one? How do you get around that one? It beats up that one, right? It beats up that one. Only Jesus is perfect. Well, how, do you, how do you get around that one? Wow. Thank you, Jesus, for that verse. I can use that as ammo whenever somebody comes at me that way. How about the one be holy as I'm holy? God really meant this, the brothers and sisters. He really means it. But you know what? The beauty about it, you can't do it on your own. You can't. God's going to do it through you. God's going to do it through you. So as you go, keep trucking. Verse 4 through 6. 3, 4 through 6. 4 through 6. We're almost there. Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Verse 5. Do you know what he was? Uh, excuse me. Let's respond. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Brother said, let's stop there. God is saying, you know who practices sin? That's practicing lawlessness. And he was revealed. Is he was manifested. He was revealed to take away sins. That's his whole purpose of coming. Jesus is coming was to destroy the work of the devil. You know what God says? You know what Jesus tells Peter? Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, paraphrasing this. And the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of God is going is God is excuse me, God is building his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail. How what's going on in the world out there gonna mingle in the church in here? Let me talk about the church world right. You know why? Because there's some fakes that get behind pulpits and won't say the truth. And they will tone it down. You know why? Because they don't want to be hated by the world. They'd rather be loved by the world and hated by God. People say, oh, that's pretty hardcore. No, it's not. Wait till we get to this end. Wait till we get to this end. Look at this. So verse 6 again. Every, verse 5. You know that he was revealed so that we might, he might take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Verse 6. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has not known him or look at, has not seen him or known him. Brother, so that's some scary stuff. So what are they talking about? Like, check about just on the way over here to church. Like, so am I not saved then? That's not what I'm talking about. I don't want you to be condemned, brother and sister in Christ. Because some of you might be thinking, on my way to church, I talked to my wife mean. I talked to my husband mean. I, I, you know what? I yelled at my kids on the way to church. I fell into some sins, but it just spread, spread right in the scripture. Those who sin didn't, have not seen him and do not know him. So what is he talking about? Because on the way up here, I, I yelled at my kid in the back seat, right? Right? My kid threw juice on the window. I don't know. You fill in the blank, Right? So what does he mean there? Check this out. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. Brothers and sisters, the moment you got saved, you will have a different, different relationship with your sin. That's what it means. He's not, you're not going to be sinless, but you know what? Literally, we've used this before. If you have Jesus living in you, you will sin less. You won't be sinning as much because you'll be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Notice this, where you, where you were at when you first got saved. In your life, aren't you sinning less? I'm not talking about being sinless. Are you sinning less the more you know and know your creator and become like him? Or are you sinning more? That's where it's at. It says because the one who continues in sin 
Jesus has not seen him or does not know him. That's scary. Look at what John writes. Verse 6, everyone who remains in him does not sin. That means you will not continue in this repetitive sin habitually. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. Verse 7. And you see here. So let me hit on this before we go there. How does Jesus' death on the cross, dying under the wrath of God and rising on the third day, conquering sin and death, not change someone's life? Who claims that they believe in him? Look at the thief at the cross. Remember the thief at the cross? The thief at the cross with a little bit of life he had in him automatically started living a different life. Once he put his faith and trust in Jesus, automatically he was slandering Jesus, talking smack to Jesus. And then you know what he says? He starts defending Jesus against other people and said, he did nothing wrong. We deserve to be up here. This man is an innocent man. With the little bit of life he had left, he used that little bit of breath to defend Jesus. The little bit of life he had left, he used it to show Jesus, to defend Jesus. Can you imagine that? The little bit of life. He could have begged the Romans, please take me off. He did it. He used it to glorify Jesus. The little bit of breath he had left. The breath that you have. And many of you have a lot of breath left. You use it to glorify God. The thief on the cross used the little bit of life he had left to glorify Jesus. He said, Lord, please don't forget about me to you when you enter your kingdom. Please don't. Everybody says, today, I, today, pretty much I promise you. Because you know why? When God says something, it's a promise. God the Son said, Today I promise you, you will be with me in paradise. He said to the other thief, to one thief. You know what happened with Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, get down from that tree. I'm going to go have a meal with you. Do you know what Zacchaeus did automatically? If I sold anything from anybody, wrongfully, I'm going to give back fourfold. I'm going to give back. His life changed automatically, drastically. Drastically. From the tree to the ground changed. And he says, do you see this in years of your life? Tree to the ground changed. On the cross, a little bit of life left in him, crucified on the cross, being tortured, beaten and, beat and battered and whipped to Steve, used the last of his breath to glorify God in the flesh and say, don't forget about me. Use his breath to tell the other thief, we deserve to be on this cross. He's innocent. So the long breath that we have, the thief knew he was going to die. You don't know when you're going to die. The thief knew death was around the corner for him. And he used his breath to glorify God. How do we use our breath? It's to glorify God? That hits on a whole other level. I don't let that move the ball for me. We keep trucking. A born again believer has a built in guard against habitual sin due to a new nature. Due to being born again, you will live differently. Let's just roll through this. Romans 6, verse 2. Romans 6, okay, we'll go up to it on the overhead. I don't want to lose y'all. Romans 6, verse 2. Look at you're going to see this. Romans 6, verse 2. Look at here. Absolutely not. How can we who die to sin still live in it? That's just verse 2. And look at here. Jump to verse 4 through 6. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into his death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by what? Sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to what? Sin. Clearly, he says it. Now look at this. Have we jumped there, brother? Jump to 7 and 8. Since a person who has died is freed from sin, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Because we know, nine, we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. Check this out, verse 10. For the death he died, he died, one, he died to sin. He said he died to sin once and for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to who? To God. Verse 11. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Clear as day. 9 to 12. Look at this row. 9 to 12. I mean, uh, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. Others they say it's lust. 13. And do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons of unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead. Offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons of righteousness. Every part of your body, do you offer it to God? 
your eyes, the things that you look at, your hands, your feet, your mouth. Do you offer that to God as a weapon of righteousness? Or your eyes, your feet, your hands, your mouth, whatever it is, are they used for weapons of unrighteousness? As we keep trucking. Lawlessness, that's like going overboard of transgress. Let me just break this down in modern day terms, to layman terms. In God's law, God shows the ultimate sense. Check this out. Lawlessness is the ultimate sense of rebellion in a person. It shows lawlessness is the ultimate sense of rebellion. Let me just go out of my way to go against God, pretty much. That's what they're saying. In a person living, watch, living as if there is no law. They're living like if there is no God. Can you see where that has changed in your life? Can you see that? Where the areas where you struggle in your life, are you doing things to be better in your life there? Do you struggle with small things in your life that we shouldn't be in those small areas in our lives no more? Why are we still there? Why? Ask yourself why. Is it because of the flesh? Why are we still there? That's what I ask myself. Why am I still in the same boat? I don't want to be in the same boat no more. I'll get out the boat and start swimming. I'll swim. I'll swim. Check this out. Another reason a Christian cannot habitually continue practicing sin because it is incompatible with the work of Christ. Christ died to sanctify a believer. The moment you die, the moment you die to your old life, God has given you a new life. Christ died to sanctify a believer here on earth. And so he comes until he glorifies a believer. You may be, you may, you've been made, excuse me, you've been made justified and you are being sanctified to the day that you will be glorified. That's what the Bible teaches. As we keep going to this. To keep sinning goes against Jesus' work of breaking the power of sin in a believer's life. As you see here, brothers and sisters, the one who lives in habitual sin does not know Jesus. God makes it very clear through John. John is saying, if a person is saying, I got saved years back and lives a life in habitual sin, John is saying that person, that that person, salvation has never took place in that person's life. Clear as day, John is saying, that person does not know God. The love of God is not in that person. That person is a liar. Not my words. The Holy Spirit through Apostle John says that clearly. Clearly. That person never got saved. That person has just been self-deceived. So today you ask yourself, do you see these characteristics in your life where your life has been changed and it's continuing to change? And where you're being convicted at times. If you're being convicted in your heart and you're not right with God, repent. And you can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. You can. Don't ever let anybody tell you that there's something you've done in your life that you can never be right with God. God paid the price before. That you couldn't pay. Why would you try to pay it on your own? Why would you try to pay it for God? It's never going to work. How good has it been working? It doesn't work that way. Jesus paid for it. It says, you see here. Seven through eight. Children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous. Just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the what? Of the devil. For the devil has sinned in the beginning. The son of God was revealed for this purpose. What purpose? What purpose, John? To destroy the devil's work. To destroy the devil's works. Do you see God, through Jesus Christ, destroying the devil's works in your life? Where the devil's trying to work in areas in your life, do you see God the Father, through the power of his Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, through the power of God the Son, destroying those devil's works in your life? Do you see them breaking apart, shattering? Do you see them? Because this is, this is why he was revealed. This is why he was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. So as you see here. So John did. You know what John did? John starts off in verse 7. He warns them not to let anyone deceive them. John knew that false teachers were trying to come at the core of the gospel. He didn't want any Christian to fall into that trap by them accepting false teaching. That you can live a life of habitual sin and still have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He didn't want people to believe that. That's not true. So look at this. So what John did is he just kept coming with the truth. Notice this. 
John just keeps reminding them repeatedly of the basics of Christianity, which are the need for obedience. Write this down or memorize it. John reminds the believers of this. The need for obedience to God. The need for love for God. The serious, life-changing need that John, I mean, that John goes over, over and over, is a proper view of Jesus Christ and who Jesus really is. Those are the need in a believer's life. The proper view of Jesus. Who Jesus really says he is. Brothers and sisters, the real born-again believer's lifestyle is totally opposite of the lifestyle that these false teachers believe. They live the lifestyle of practicing sin. These false teachers that John was talking about, they live the lifestyle of practicing sin. Christ died on the cross to transform sinners. Let me share this fact with you. Those truly born again have replaced the habit of sinning with the habit of righteous living. Brothers and sisters, I see that in many of, you, many of your lives. The habit that you had of habitual sinning has been replaced with the habit of righteous living. Who does that? God does that. God does that. We're going to end with this. Those who have been born, truly been born again, they will show that they are being made more and more like Jesus as they keep living for Jesus. Question, do you see that in your life? Do you see where you're living more and more like Jesus as we end on this verse? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Let this be a highlighter for you. 20 and 21. Look at this. Look what Apostle Paul writes. Galatians 2, 20 and 21. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. He's saying, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Look at verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Paul's saying, the life I live, I live for God. The reason I live for God is because his son loved me so much and gave his life for me. That it changed every part of my living being. That I live for God. Paul's saying that. My old self has been crucified with Christ. Can you see that in your life, brothers and sisters? You know why? You won't be able to sin the same way that you used to. It'll be impossible. It'll be impossible. This is how, right here, verse 10. We went 1 through 10. Last verse. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brothers or sisters. <laughs> brothers and sisters, the one that hates to do what God says shows that they're not children of God. They're not. You know what? A, a child is not going to listen to another parent over and over and over and over. They're not. They're going to listen to their parent. They feel comfortable around their parent. So you know what? When God has changed a believer, a person's life, and, and that person becomes a child of God, that person will listen to God. They may be a little bit rebellious, a little bit stubborn, may take a few spankings, they want to leave a few slapping them behind the head type of stuff, right? But you will listen to God eventually. You will. If you're his child, you will. My baby's up here, so I don't want you to get confused with when I was saying, Lolly, Lolly, sit down. Th that's my baby. I can talk to her that way. <laughs> my baby. I mean it in a good way. So this is what I'm saying. My baby knows her dad's voice. All I have to do is sit there at a time and say, Lolly, stop. And she knows her dad's voice like I know my daughter's voice. I know my children's voice. How much more when you're crying out to God the Father that does God not hear your prayer? That God does not hear your voice? He sent his son to die for you. Come on, how are you not going to, how are you going to think in your life that God is not hearing you if he did that for you? And yet while you were still his enemies, Christ died for you? And now automatically he's not going to hear you? Not my God. Not the God of this Bible. He died so that you can live. He died so you can live a new life. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we preach that Paul says. We preach Christ and Christ crucified. That's the God that changes lives. That's the God that breaks chains. That's the God that makes sin be slapped up. Slapped up and fall up off of you. That's the God that has you choke out sin. That's the God that has you walk in righteousness and love other believers. That's the God that we serve that died in the rose for us so that we can have a new life. That when we put our faith and trust in him as our Lord and Savior and what he has done for us and not what we can do for him. That's the God of this Bible. And his name is Jesus Christ, the living God. Brothers and sisters, that's who your God is. Listen in prayer. Heavenly Father, 
I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything that you're doing. Have your way with us. Thank you for moving when you see me moving our life and keep when you see me kept. Thank you for loving us so much that you came and lived a sinless life that we couldn't live and paid the penalty and satisfied the wrath of God so that we could live with you forever and in heaven, Lord Jesus, until that day. Use us mightily to go out and lead more people to you. Like Brother Bob brought this page earlier for these children. The harvest is ready, but the workers are few. Lord, we're praying to you. You said pray to the pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and send more workers. Send more workers out into this field, Father God, with us. And we'll plow this field and bring them back so that your name will be glorified, your name will be praised. So that people will know that there's a God in heaven that they can be saved to. We thank you and we love you, Lord. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.